I want to contrast this, this class here. I want to con make a contrast between the two cities, um, the New Jerusalem and Babylon. And uh, so we've been making this contrast between the beast and the lamb, the lambs and the beasts, and now we want to talk about it in light of this. Um, I'll just read a couple of things here, but um, uh, it, it's worth discussing. Uh, the lamb has his city and the beast also has his own city. Those cities are, are a reflection of the character of the one to whom they belong. And that's exactly what Babylon is and what New Jerusalem is. New Jerusalem is the bride of Christ, the bride of the Lamb, and she reflects him. Um, so uh, the New Jerusalem is the, is the Lamb's city. He lives in her and he shines out of her. All right. When you read in the book of Revelation and you start, and my goal is to pick the, the larger imagery, but the, we've, this, we've dealt with this many different times over the years of the scriptures that talk about, you know, have you seen, you know, the, the angel comes to John and says, have you seen the new Jerusalem? Have you seen the bride of the lamb, new Jerusalem? The bride or the, or the, we're not going to New Jerusalem someday. We are New Jerusalem. That's what it says. That's what the scriptures declare. Have you seen his bride, New Jerusalem? And it's, 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 the imagery is as of a city, but that means many members to a body, but he's on the throne in the middle of it, Right? But not only that, there are these walls and everything that are made of transparent gold. So that when you look at her, you see him on the inside. All right. Um, and then within, within him, within her, him within her, out from the Lamb, out from the throne of the Lamb, in the midst of New Jerusalem, her, is a river that flows outward, not inward. I mean, that's pretty good. Because it's, it's, and that river flows out to the nations and it brings healing to the nations. It's blessing others. So there's an example of, of healing and believing in it. But it's not like the river's flowing back this direction. You know, a couple of years ago, there was a lot of songs about the river, and everybody wanted to jump in it and, you know, I don't know. You know, it, it's okay, but it's not really the true scriptural thing. Um, uh, it's like the river's flowing to us. But in, in the truest spirit of it, it should be flowing out of us. And Jesus said that. Out of your innermost being shall flow. Out of your, you see, we're like this. I'm dry. I'm needy. You know, Lord, send, you know, rivers in to me or something like that. As if it's going to come from above. Jesus said that's supposed to come out of you to others. One of the quickest ways to stagnate, one of the quickest ways to stop the flow is to try to get that river to reverse and start coming into you instead of out of you. The river's in you because it's, it's, it's Christ on the throne within you. The throne of your heart. And Revelation paints that picture coming out of the throne that the lamb sits on in the midst of her and then flowing out of her See, and the beauty of that picture, I don't know that we can grasp it as well as Jesus can, the beauty of that picture to the Lord, to the Lamb, is that it's flowing out of her, just like it's flowing out of him. Because it is flowing out of him, out of him, out of her. Now we would say, what's well, flowing out of him to her? But she is meant to be after his kind. 
She is bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. She is the container. She is the only one that loves him in this way to become him. You, you know what I mean. To be conformed to his image. And so, you know, it, does, it never says in the book of Revelation, well, the lamb on the throne, he smiled. But I got a feeling he in his heart he's smiling because she is with him in his flow. And that flow is to others. Now, I don't want to get off on this too much, but the contrasts are just too great. You read the Song of Solomon, and Solomon in that Song of Solomon is the king representing the Lord, and she is um, supposedly, be, you know, the wife or the bride, um, the bride of the lamb. And she begins with, you know, all of this stuff. Well, I am, you know... I'm dark and I'm needy and I'm this and that and whatever. But the more he gets around her, he declares what she is in his eyes. This is what you are. You know, shut up. <laughs> now, now, the Lord doesn't say that, but I'm trying to make a point. He doesn't want coming out of her mouth rivers of junk. He wants him in her. And he wants the flow to be his mind, not her mind about herself or her mind about her failures or her mind. You know, once you turn it inward, folks, then you're looking for the river to flow inward. And that's, that's the quickest way to shut it off. Because then it's all, it's all, the pool is within you and, and it's not a fountain anymore. And once that pool just stays in there, it'll stagnate. And, um, you know, you've heard my, my contrast of the Sea of Galilee with the Dead Sea. The Sea of Galilee, it comes down from Mount Hermon and the, and the snows melt and it flows down and it flows down into that sea and it fills it up with life and, you know, freshness, but it has an outlet and it flows on down the, the Jordan River, you know, and, but it eventually goes down to the Dead Sea. And it goes into that Dead Sea, and there it stagnates because there are no outlets. No self-giving. No pouring out. Only pour in. And the more you stay in that state, the more stagnant you become. It's just a law. Yes, sir. saying in that it's not about Jesus or, you know, things about Jesus or any of the other things, it's Him. Right. You know, and if we if we drink Him, His portion of that, yeah. then it, it, it's such yeah. a different thing than something pouring, you know, like a river pouring in. No. One drink and it's exponentially uh, it, it manifests in an exponential way. It's like feeding the 5,000 with the loaves and fishes. He increases it. Uh, you know, I mean, the, don't you know when the, the multitudes were, were hungry and thirsty and tired and everything? Jesus started passing out bread, but he passed it to his disciples, and he said, go pass it out. He didn't say, you eat. You know. He said... You know, you go pass it out, and they did that, and everyone got fed. Everyone got fed. Well, I was thinking, I got to hoard this little bit because people aren't going to be that way. Well, you know, as long as you're living in Babylon, <laughs> they ain't going to be that way. They're going to be selfish. But that's where you have to gather to those that are of his spirit and his nature. <clears throat> All right. Um, so uh, in Revelation 22, 
verse 2 is where that talks about. You don't have to turn there, but that's where that flow is. Um, <clears throat> let's, uh, let's go to Revelation 17, and let's just examine a few scriptures here. Revelation 17 and verse 1. Um, and there came out, uh, or the, and there came one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls and talked with me, saying unto me, Come here and I will show thee the judgment of the great harlot that sitteth upon many waters. Now, at this stage right now, in this uh, chapter, uh, the first beginnings of it, he's not showing the judgment. It's come here and I will show you the bride of the beast. Because remember, he says that to John, come here and I'll show you the bride of the lamb. It's almost the same exact words, just I want you to, and this is, this is the point. He's saying, I want, because he's talking to John in both of these cases. I want you to see what union with the beast is produces and I want you to see what union with not just Jesus because it doesn't use the term Jesus hardly at all in the book of Revelation oneness with the lamb produces okay so come and see that's what he's doing and the, again the words are almost exactly the same uh, let's look down at uh, verse 15 now And he saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest, where the harlot sitteth, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these, these shall hate the harlot. And I don't know, King James, I think, says whore, doesn't it? Okay. And shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. Okay, so this is showing you that which is one with her, but controlled and beat down and pushed down and, you know, uh, not like Jesus, who frees you to become what he intends for you, who, uh, you know, and you see this in churches. I mean, you see beasts that try to control everything and that try to, that don't want anything outside of, the box, you know, um, and a lot of a lot of times it's for fear that somebody's going to make a mistake. But you know, you don't really learn anything without making some mistakes. You don't. You need to make some mistakes and still be loved. Now that doesn't mean you let everybody run wild, and it doesn't mean that if somebody's gonna make a mistake that's gonna hurt them or somebody else that you don't deal with that properly and in the right spirit, what it means is, is that you nurture an environment so that people can become what God wants them to become. And again, I don't know what that is for you. I mean, you know, I don't know all of the, where that leads, but I know that God knows. And I know that my job is to, is to be his hands, as it were, to guide you into whatever that is, or to, or to help you in it, help you find it. Um, and then verse, uh, chapter 19, verse 2. True and righteous are his judgments, for he hath judged the great whore who did corrupt the earth with her fornication and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. All right. So Babylon is the beast's city. She is a harlot, prostitute, whore. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about that. She is a harlot that joins to others for personal gain or satisfaction or advantage, which could include monetary advantage. She does not love those with whom she joins. 
but seeks all the advantage and benefits that can be gained by temporal unions. Are you following the picture here? That's why she's called that. Okay, and that's what she does. She joins to whatever will help her get what she wants. Okay. Uh, the very concept of fornication involves no real commitment on the part of either party. No responsibility, no real commitment. It is simply, you know, I, I'm sure I put it here. Yeah, here it is. All is done for one's own pleasure or financial gain. Maybe in their, in their situation, pleasure. In her situation, financial gain. But it's everybody's trying to get what they want that makes them happy. You know, well, what's wrong with that? <laughs> well, first of all, you know, I don't think the goal is to live life down here to be made happy, but to serve the Lord, to bless others. That's the way, I mean, you know, that's the way I see it. And I think that's the way Jesus sees it. And I think that's the way that he lived. <clears throat> It is certainly not the time or the place to try to make heaven on earth peace when there is no peace. Peace when there is no peace. You can, you can fool yourself, you know. You can, you can try to build a utopia and God will tear it down because that's not what he's trying to get people to build. You can try to build a, to a, a tower to heaven, Babel, Babylon, and that's where they all started babbling on after that. <laughs> Remember, they all speak in different languages. It has behind it some sort of religion, just like Cain had some, you know, a religious goal. It wasn't pure, just do whatever you want. Cain was trying to serve God, but not by the lamb, with the, with the, the best of his fruit, yeah. not the crucified dead lamb that Abel offered. And, um, and the same with the Tower of Babel. We'll let us, we'll reach to heaven. Okay, well, if you'll notice at the very end of the book, when, you, when the bride really gets formed up, she starts coming down, not going up. She starts coming down. And this is a picture of her becoming self-giving, bringing that which is true of God down to those who need it, not trying to work our way up to God. And, and that's what Babylon was, was nothing but work, Babel. Babel, Tower of Babel. It's nothing but works. So there's always this religious thing built into it, and it sounds so good. But it always leaves out Christ crucified. And it always really has self at the heart of the, of the motivation and of the goal. The truth is we can't always tell what's in someone's heart. But we can always... Stay in tune with the Lord and God will show you because sooner or later, you know, people will show it. Yes. I think I'm going back a couple of steps. We were talking about how um, everyone's getting what they want. That's kind of the essence of the harlot. You're, you're reaching out, you're getting what you want. And that always comes, for some reason, God has worked with so that. If you operate that way, it's always at someone else's expense. It's, we can never really get what we want and it'd be a harmless action that's kind of in a vacuum. Every time we take what we want, someone has to pay for that. Yes. But the lamb, I mean, but God doesn't mean that we never are, aren't ever supposed to have anything. Is that when it comes by his hand, it's, it's, it doesn't do damage to others. Right. And so there is a way to receive things, but it's just not that taking, right. you know. Well, and it's so, not, you know, he said, seek first the kingdom of God, and I'll give you all these things. He's got no problem giving us these things. It's not, it's not that. What he has a problem with is selfish, self-centered people who are just doing what they're doing, building relationships for their own convenience that will help them get to where they want or get, get what they want. And you, you gave a great example, Mallory, because the, 
The truth is, if there's only so much resources, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to stay out of politics right here, but there's only so much oil on the planet. And with the Chinese coming on and their economy and their, everything being based on that same thing, supplies are dwindling. Okay, well, what does that mean? That means somebody's going to fight for what they, <clears throat> what they want and somebody else is going to fight. And if everybody, if everybody just started fighting to get what they want, there's not even enough to go around in that sense. Unless, like what you said, the Lord provides. Uh, what is it, five loaves and two fishes? Not enough to go around. Not enough to go around. Okay, but when we're in tune with his heart and his kingdom, meaning his kind of government, what governs him, not just an outward kingdom, but what governs him governs us, then he takes care of us. Amen. And his kingdom is to take care of others, mm -hmm. you know. And many times that's your own loss. But if you lose, you gain. The scriptures declare this. But you have to lose by Christ. You don't just lose. Yeah. I, I think about the seven sorcerer. Because, in that contrast, because, like you said, um, you know, the Lord came to care for others. But seven sorcerer was a real good contrast to the complete opposite. He wanted the ability to heal people so he could be saw, seen as something. So he wanted everything drawn toward himself. And it wasn't really, his motivation had nothing to do with really healing people or helping people, but that people would see him as being something. Yeah, yeah. And that's usually the motive behind it. I mean, we, again, we can't always know everyone's motive, but the Lord does. The Lord does. <clears throat> um, therefore, all relationships are for their own convenience and to supply their own need. Thank you. Um, then I, I said this, contrary wise, today's marriage vows usually contain the words for better or worse, for richer or poorer, in sickness and in health, till death do us part. I mean, I remember when Deb and I first got married and everything was going good, and then, I don't know, I did something wrong, and she looked at me and I said, here's the worst part. <laughs> this, is the, this is, you remember the better? This is the worst. <clears throat> um, and she said back to me, well, when are we going to get to the richer part? <laughs> <laughs> we, we've been in the poorer part here. <laughs> in sickness and in health till death do us part. And that's, um, that's saying, you know, I don't, think, I don't think mankind can live up to that stuff without Christ. But uh, well, I don't, you know, because it's that, all that means that you're not going by what you want. And in truth, what is meant to be written into that is, that you love somebody more than you love yourself and you'll go through anything to be with them. Now, the bride of Christ ought to certainly live up to that. All right. Um, yeah, I was thinking about that little thing that happened too with Deb and I. She's, I she made a decision on something early and then another decision and decision. I said, I said, wait a minute. You know, you're making all the decisions here. And she said, well, you make the big decisions and I'll make the little ones. And I said, okay. So about six months later, all these decisions she was making, I said, you know, when are we going to get to any big ones? She said, well, when we do, I'll let you know. <laughs> no. She didn't do that. She's nothing like that. Most of you know her. All right, a further contrast can be seen in how each city handles 
their enemies. Oh, baby. I'm telling you, people, this is a real, you know, this is where the spotlight really shows how you handled your enemies, you know. Um, it's, all right. For example, the harlot drinks the blood of her enemies while the lamb willingly pours out his own blood for his enemies. That's, uh, well, our time's almost up, but that's Rev Revelation 17, 6 and Romans 5, 10. He is the life of New Jerusalem, and so his nature reigns in her in the same manner as what he lives, because it's his life, it's his way. She and the beasts, when there are enemies, they don't put up with it. When there are enemies, when an enemy does something wrong, they point it out. It's the old make them look bad so that I'll look better. Um, Jesus died for his enemies. Jesus died for the ones who killed him. And he died with the hope and the desire uh, for them to prosper, to, to, you know, flourish instead of being destroyed. We think, well, why would God send everybody to hell then? God's not sending them to hell. <laughs> yeah, they're sending themselves to hell, you know. His, you know, what does the scripture say? He desires that none perish, but all come to the knowledge of the truth. But folks, there are some people who've made up their minds that they, they don't like the lamb. They don't like the concept of sacrifice. They don't like, the, they don't want to be selfless. They don't want to be living sacrifices. They don't want to be a servant. They want you to serve them. I mean, that's it. They want you to serve them. And there's nothing you can do about that except love them. You can't beat them hard enough to change their inner being. You can't talk them out of selfishness. You, can't, you can only love them. You can only take the hardest slap they give and turn the other cheek and just love them. It's all you can do. And you can believe that life does come out of death. You can believe that in selfless giving, you know, what did Paul say? Death worketh in me, but life in you. You can, you can believe that and you can live even though, you know, it, it hurts or it's insulting or whatever to be slapped, you, can, you live in peace, and they don't have peace. And one of the saddest things for me is to think about what they must go through. Because in all that's rough and whatever that I might go through, and all I can, you know, I mean, I'm with the Lord. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I love the Lord. And so it gives you a compassion for them. And it gives you a reason to want to lay down your life because you care. You'd, you'd say, well, I care, so I'm going to fight back. No, you just care for yourself then, you know. Only the Spirit of God can open our eyes to these things, you know. Only the Holy Spirit can really show us the heart of it and the spirit of it. The words of it are impossible without the life of Christ. They just are. That's why, you know, there's just no expectation other than just be hungry for the Lord. Just be hungry for the Lord. Just want the Lord according to his nature and according to his core, not just for what he can do for you.
get past that. Thank God he can do stuff. He'll keep doing stuff for you. He will always do stuff for you. He will go abundantly beyond what you could ever ask or think. But he wants you to stay in that tenor of heart with him until the Holy Spirit has formed his son in you completely. Father, we just thank you for your Holy Spirit who is here. And Lord, as your servant, I, my words are so frail and come so short. But may the Holy Spirit reach us and reach that love that we have for Jesus. Reach in the depths of us and touch us where no man could ever touch us. That place where we so deeply love your son that we're moved, we're moved towards him and we're moved away from those other things. Father, not that we're leaving anything, but we're going to Jesus. And in going to him, we find ourselves leaving things that we never thought we could leave. Father, let, let your mind be formed in us. Let the mind of Christ be at work in us. Let us con contemplate these things, meditate on them, ponder them in our heart till Christ is formed in us. And so, Father, we, we bless you. We bless you for your Son and for the Holy Spirit. We ask you to con continue to strengthen us for the work we have to do for the conference, to bless the work of our hands, and to know, Lord, that we don't just work, we don't just, we don't just do ministry. We serve you, Father, by your Son in us, the selfless one. We do it for you and we do it for others. And we, we, we believe that you'll be blessed in seeing that flow coming out from us to the healing of the nations. So be blessed, Father. Be blessed with the Son. Be blessed, Jesus. Be blessed with your bride. We ask it in Jesus' name.